Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 38th edition of the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival presented by Visual Communications. My name is Francis Colado, your Executive Director of Visual Communications, and thank you for connecting with us for this conversation. I'm joining you from Los Angeles, and we acknowledge the Tongva, Kish, Chumash, and other Indigenous peoples, the stories of this land before we came to live here. The Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Video Film and Video Film Festival began almost 40 years ago. And in the last four decades, we continue to celebrate artists and stories who amplify our experiences and impact our communities. Visual Communications and the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival is grateful for creators who share our values. Artists who use the power of film as a medium for change and to build and connect communities. Mira Nair embodies these values in bringing truth to power. We're honored and grateful to present Mira this year's Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival's Legacy Award in appreciation for the everlasting work that she has done and continues to do so. Thank you, Mira, for what you made happen and what you continue to make happen. Thank Folks, you. please welcome Mira Nair. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here at the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival. Thank you so much. Mira, thank you for joining us. Can you let our folks know where you're beaming from at this moment? I am here in New Delhi, India, in my own study. It's one of my three homes, and this is where I'm living most of this year. Uh, because uh, my mom is 90 years old and in great shape, I must say, and my family is here too. And uh, yeah, so Zoom allows me to work really from anywhere, uh, but I'm very happy to be here, uh, being with family and managing my work and, uh, and, you know, just being home. It's beautiful. Thank you, Mira. Um, during this year's film festival, we have a special presentation of Salam Bombay. Uh, Mira, Salam Bombay was your first feature film. Here you craft a narrative of the protagonists to tell their stories of people on the ground, stories about resilience, real people, and capturing real moments of joy. It's been 35 years then. Could you share with us your reflection on the development production from casting, especially all the collaborative ways you, you work to make this happen? Especially talking about the sequence from the documentary films that you were making before and prior to this, and just any reflections about, again, the production and, and, and genesis of this? Sure. You know, my, the genesis really began as by being an actor in political street theater in India. I worked in, with a radical playwright in Calcutta called Badar Sharkar, who taught us to tell our own stories, to make our own theater, really, which we would take out into the streets. I then became an actor for many years um, and, uh, and uh, you know, came to this country, to America, uh, on a scholarship to study, really, performance and acting. Uh, I uh, came to Harvard, which gave me a full scholarship in 1976. And, um, you know, pursued theater, but then uh, it was not for credit. So I had to look uh, for other things. And I found very fortunately for me, a course in cinema vehite filmmaking, the cinema of truth, um, taught by the great Ricky Leacock and the, later by D.A. Pennybaker, the two real pioneers of the handheld cinema vehite movement, you know, and that hooked me, you know, at the age of 19 uh, into you know, engaging with life in this sort of visual way. Um, and, and, and I spent seven years after that making films uh, in this style of Cinema Verite documentary, mostly in India, based in New York, but coming to India and living with the subjects of my film, whether they be street, you know, whether they be, um, they were the dancers and strippers in a nightclub in Bombay um, or several different subjects over seven years. And in the course of making India Cabaret, which was one of my films in 1985, where I actually lived in the tenements with the two dancers that were, you know, that, 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 you know, worked for a living in Bombay, uh, I, I was surrounded by street kids and street, you know, boys and girls who had come to this city. This is our Hollywood of India is Bombay where the dreams are spun and people believe that, you know, it's possible to see the 
extravagant fantasies that you see in Bollywood films uh, in the streets of Bombay. And a lot of kids, street kids, just jump on trains and leave, you know, terrible lively childhoods and, and come to the city. And there is almost a community of this sort of level of living, living poor, living on the streets. Um, and I befriended uh, some street kids who would come with tea every morning to, to wake up the dancers and get them off to work, you know. That was my first introduction. But my classmate at Harvard, uh, who was also from India, from Bombay, was Suni Tarapurwala. And she's from Bombay, I'm from Delhi. Uh, and I went to Suni and said, let's, let's make a film, you know, on, on on street kids. This time it was seven years of documentary filmmaking, seven years of what I call sometimes hit and run filmmaking. And when we thought of the film on street kids, it wasn't to hit and run. It was to really make a narrative that we, I at least had some control over the storytelling, the gesture, the not the hit and run, but amalgamate uh, both my work in the theater, um, my work in documentary filmmaking, in that it was of real people and real streets and real conditions, but to make it in a fictional way so that I would have greater control over light and gesture and, uh, and, and, and the story itself. Um, Suni and I plunged into uh, uh, researching a gang of rag, rag pickers for about four months in Bombay. Um, and uh, we did everything they did from uh, looking at them. We didn't pick the rags, but looking at them, rag picking, going on to weddings where they became waiters to serve, just their whole world or going to Bollywood movies to escape it all. We, you know, and then after four months of this kind of cinema verite kind of uh, documentary research, we then buckled down and brought our own imaginations to their great imaginations and you know evoked a story and then Suni wrote the screenplay while I hovered over her and the idea always was to make a workshop in the heart of the city of Bombay uh, where we gathered 129 street kids uh, in the basement of a church um, and uh, also asked wonderful uh, theater director Barry John with whom I had uh, worked as an actor in Delhi uh, to come and help us conduct this workshop. Um, throughout the course of it, it was always real street kids playing their stories. You can't, India is so riddled with class. Uh, uh, you can look at a person, you can see how they speak, you know exactly where they come from and so on. And I had no intention of using upper middle class kids or uh, English speaking kids at all because the map of life of a street kid this tribulations and trials and joys is always in their faces, in their hands, in their eyes. Um, so it was always about finding those that can tell our story, but maybe mixing it up with uh, professional actors who played, let's say, the pimp or the prostitute or, or, or the drug addict even. So it was an amalgamation of Nana Partaker, who then became a big star, uh, who played Baba, uh, who controlled this whole area in our story, of Anita Kanwar, who's a great, great unsung, wonderful actress in our, in our, in India, who played Rekha, the, the mother of Manju, and so on. And then Raghubi Ryadav and Irfan Khan, the great Irfan Khan, the actor who passed away three years ago, but after, you know, I actually, discovered him, they say, uh, in the basement of the National School of Drama at the age of 18 and asked him to leave the school and live with us and the kids uh, to conduct this workshop together and to be in the film. Um, so we brought this workshop, it was about six weeks, and it was a workshop that was conducted in the theater, in a theater way, uh, but it was also to, dis you know, to instill a kind of teaching that happened both ways, you know. Uh, we uh, we uh, started with dance, with yoga, with a, with, with a way of how to create the kind of physical and mental discipline really that you need to face the camera, uh, but also to bring in a style of not acting in the in the artificial Bollywood sense, which is what we are all raised on the kind of arch non way, you know, not the way really people speak and Bombay is a is a, is is a place that everyone gathers from all over India. The language of Bombay is a kind of beautiful street 
patois that is a mix of several zones, you know. So, um, so that was the language that we wanted to use in this film. It is normally not done in our films. Um, and uh, through this interaction with the children over six weeks, of debates that are of issues that were important to them, uh, showing them, you know, Charlie Chaplin, showing them Francois Truffaut, showing them uh, movies that were alternative to the Bollywood style. Uh, it, it, it even came to a point where acting became a bad word, you know, in our, in our workshop, you know, we would improvise scenes and other kids would tell the other kids, you know, oh, you're acting, come on, man, stop acting, you know, and it was a way of really instilling that naturalism and that realism um, with all its delight and all its mischief and all its pain uh, as the style of acting. And then we brought in uh, the screenplay about four weeks into the screen, into the workshop and started actually rehearsing scenes and improving scenes uh, mm. based on the language of the children. And then finally brought in the lights and the camera much later, like in the sixth week uh, to see and to see just to check it all out and to also to interweave the professional actors with the, with the kids so that they, there was, so we were creating a kind of seamless world, you know? And then we went out into the streets, <laughs> 52 <laughs> days, 52 locations. In 1986, no cell phones, no, you know, team, I, I used to wear I, what I still wear, Indian clothes, and, and I used to have a major rope, big rope around my waist and a megaphone at the end of the rope. And we were always in exteriors. And in India, the loads of people, especially in Bombay on train stations and so on. And I would just, you know, stand like this and like a politician and I would appeal to the crowds that would come and watch us that please, this is our work, you know, you can look at our work, please don't disturb it. And I would twirl around with the edge of my rope around my waist and give it to one member of the crowd and twirl to the end and, and then and have the crowd themselves control themselves behind the rope and then take my megaphone and appeal again and say, let us, you know, let us do this. Uh, and also those were the days of 35 mm film uh, were very expensive. We could get only a limited amount of stock a day. We had no money, the same old story. We had very little money. Um, and we had often no more than two or three takes that we could ever do, you know? And so, but by the time we started shooting, the children were so tuned, you know, to everything from continuity, from which hand they, held the tea to the, you know, and, and day players would come in and the children would teach them like what they had done in the previous scene. So it was an amazing, amazing, you know, sort of dialogue between us all the time. Um, but people thought we were nuts because we had the great Sandy Sissel, there was a cinematographer, it was her first feature film and she was not going to compromise. So even above above Kamatipura, which is a red light area or above the railway stations, she would hang these great silk diffusion material, you know, just to make everything look a certain way and not have that harsh light. And people would think, you know, what is going on? Um, are there movie stars here or what is it? But they would look and it was just a, you know, a, a dusty street kid, you know, and they would say, what is, you know, going on? And um, so people would not make sense of uh, what we were doing, which was probably for the better, because if we had, uh, you know, major movie stars, uh, our work would not happen. But we literally would, um, you know, we had, and we shot in the real locations, and we shot in brothels, we shot uh, in actual places that we would then amp up, heighten, it. sorry, uh, that we would amp up and heighten for the visualness mm -hmm. of it. You know, in India, we use color in a fantastic, almost phosphorescent way. Um, one of the great, one of the critics I remember when Salam Bombay came out said, it's the beginning of the phosphorescent new wave. And it really was, I would see a fuchsia wall in one brothel, then I would be filming in another, but we painted that brothel, that same fuchsia. Um, the wonderful Mitch Epstein, who's a wonderful, you know, great photographer, was the production designer and really worked very closely with me to create this sensibility constantly through the mm. film, uh, whether it be the circus or whether it be the brothel. Um, and because of the 
because of not having money, we always had a plan A and a plan B with the, for the rain. You know, we had that big rain sequence when Chai Pao, the tea boy has to deliver the tea in the rain. And there was only one window in this uh, Kamatipura, the, the red light area that we were shooting in that, um, that from which you could see the rain and the entire wide shot of the rain. We didn't have rain machines or anything of the sort. So, but that window was in a working brothel. And, but we had a deal, we had a, I had a wonderful uh, arrangement with the union of the brothels, um, the union of madams, they used to call me madame also, <laughs> where whatever we were doing, if it rained, we would go up to that window and film Jai Pao down below on the rain. And, uh, and uh, you know, and, and when we went, when it started raining, we all fled up there and there were three clients getting serviced you know, with, with curtains between them. And we had to put this huge 35 mm camera across three sets of legs. I should say six sets of legs because it was six set of legs. And, and we'd get to the, you know, vantage point and, 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 and film it, you know, say action, you would go downstairs in the rain. So it was really filmed, you know, cinema Vahite style, but also very visually, you know, very much, you know, the visual was sacred, as sacred as anything else. So that's how we made this film. Um, we have a we have some a slogan at the end of the film saying, uh, "Salam Bombay, third, 52 days, 52 locations. What problem? No problem. No God, <laughs> glory. You know, it, it, it. These were the slogans that would keep us going while shooting, and that's what we employed. So it was one of those life and death kind of movies in the sense that I literally did not know from one day to the next, you know, what would happen. And uh, also the money was so short that I would be shooting during the day and then on phone calls at night because the time difference with Europe or America helped me uh, because I would be chasing grants or chasing, you know, uh, government subsidies or whatever would come my way at night after shooting, which would pretty much determine the next day of shooting. So, you know, these are the crazy things that one can do when you're really pursuing your heart and your uh, passion, you know, and, and, and um, I had no idea that Salam Bombay would become what it had, what it became, you know, at the time. And that is also a great uh, learning for me uh, from the Bhagavad Gita, from one of our great books, um, is to beware the fruits of action, you know, not to think about the action, not to think about reward, but to beware the fruits of action, to just do what mm. you are doing fully and completely, uh, because you don't know where that fullness will lead you, you know. And uh, that was amazing because when we finished the film and uh, I cut the film with the wonderful editor, Barry Alexander Brown, who has cut a number of my films since then and also works closely with Spike Lee. Um, you know, I, I, he was cutting uh, Spike Lee's uh, She's Gotta Have It. We were sharing an, uh, uh, an editing room in New York at the time. We were both, Spike and I, um, you know, were, were um, saving money by 12 hours a day. He would work 12 hours at night. I would work. And, and, uh, and he had a great success with She's Gotta Have It. But I never thought that Salam Bombay could do anything like that because it was in Hindi, it was in street patois, it was uh, in many ways a foreign film, but a foreign film that would be foreign in India too, you know, and uh, because not films were not made like this uh, in the theaters. So, but anyway, what happened was quite different because it won the Camera d'Or in the Cannes Film Festival, which is the biggest prize for uh, the best first feature, which was an extraordinary prize. It also was extraordinary is that it came with $50,000, which got me out of debt in one fell swoop because I, my debt was exactly $48,000. And, and I think we spent $2,000 on a party for all, but, uh, but it was exactly that. And, you know, sort of... Um, put me on the map in some ways. Uh, and, and, uh, the, and the extraordinary part was that when making Salam Bombay, which was very much inspired by the Hector Babenko's great film, Pichot uh, from Brazil, I, the morning we started shooting Salam Bombay, I read in the Indian newspapers that the kid who played Pichot had just been murdered in Brazil. 
And I, I just thought this can never and will never happen with us and our children. Uh, the, the whole idea from the beginning of Salam Bombay to creating it was to see if we could make a difference, uh, you know, was to see if art could change the world. And, and um, so I had asked a wonderful psych child psychologist, Dinah Stafford, to work as my assistant director and associate director, mainly to work with the kids to see what we could create that would be long lasting for the, for the, to, to sort of honor the kids on the street with a childhood, you know, which was the, sort of the intention. And that was the, that was the idea of creating Salam Balak Trust. Balak means child. And we had that right from the inception. It was not new news. It was just that when the kid who played Pishot was killed, the day we started shooting, it was almost a, another catalyst that we had to do this. And uh, sure enough, with the success of the film, immediately, a month later, we created formally Salam Balak Trust, mm -hmm which I'm very, very happy to tell you is 35 years old today in New Delhi, India, and in Bombay, India. And I think collectively between the two centers in Bombay and Delhi, we have about 17 centers for street kids. Wow. In, in India, in these two cities, which are the major cities, you know, which is the cities where they come. Um, and about 5,000 kids come through our portals and live in these centers, which are uh, a year, 5,000 children a year. And, and our emphasis within these centers, not only to give them housing and an education, but our emphasis has been very devotedly to the arts. So the kids are exposed in very professional ways to puppetry, to photography, to dance, to choreography, to uh, playmaking. So every year in both cities, there are major annual events which the kids do themselves. Um, and, you know, plays, uh, movies, all kinds of things like that, apart from their vocational training that goes on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very, also very pleased this week because I'm making um, a stage musical, uh, hopefully Broadway bound of Monsoon Wedding uh, my other film, and 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 I'm looking for acrobats and and uh, younger people to literally be physical theater, and we're going right back to Salam Balak Trust uh, because our kids, who are now of course adults and and teaching other kids in our trust, are going to be auditioned for this musical and probably will make the grade and come right on professional stages across wow. the world as they have already. So it's an ongoing circle, you know. Um, and uh, and I'm really, it, it's rare because I've tried to do this in my working life to see if art could make a difference. But with Salam Bombay, we truly have done that. I think that's sort of what we were, when we were looking back into your work and the legacy of it and how evergreen Salam Bombay was or is. Um, one of the things that our programmers voice, especially with, with using kids from the ground, street kids, was really, it is cinema verite in the narrative format. And I, I think even they also voiced that it does come through when you have to tell them you only have limited stock and we only have one shot left, right? It yeah. is sort of that. And, and I think even the production that you did that we were saying was, yeah. it does come from this point of living day to day yeah. as, as, a, as a, 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 a that, but, I think one of the things that that we really enamor with the work, especially with the the Salam Balak Trust, was you know in this space that we all operate sometimes, where film is very extractive to our communities. You've created the opposite, where you created abundance to keep it going. So, um, I and that's the reason why I, internally we just like, oh, Mira has to be the Legacy Award for this year, and this is what we need to do, and we really. Um, just wanted to highlight that work that you created and, and, and do that. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you so uh, much. You know, um, one of the things too was obviously um, Ken and, 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 and the camera Dior. How is that for you at that moment, 1988 or so, 34 years ago? And how is that a springboard to, to, to the rest of the, you know, the 90s for you and everything else that you created? How... How did that transpire and all about? Well, you know, 
I never saw myself as winning anything. <laughs> so I was just so dazzled. Actually, the Cannes Film Festival was the first feature film festival I had ever been in. You know, I was a documentary filmmaker prior to that. And, and I had never been in, in anything half as glamorous uh, as that place, you know. And I had no money. So I did not have publicity things. I did not have posters. I did not have anything. I used to take other people's buttons. They would have these buttons uh, to proclaiming their movie. And we would cut up Salam Bombay, the title, and we would, uh, you know, cello tape it onto these buttons. <laughs> that was the publicity I had. So, you know, but they loved the, the film when they showed the film. It was the closing night of the film festival. And it was just like, uh, 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 just, it was 30 minute ovation. You know, I just, I did not know what to do. <laughs> you know, I was almost in tears. I didn't know what to do. And, and, and then my, my mother, you know, was there, my dad was there the first time they'd ever come with me to any place, you know, like film wise. And we, we were in saris and, uh, and India was not known at all, you know, in France that much and whatever. So, you know, my mother used to get uh, noticed in her sari on the street after Salam Bombay played and they would come and say oh are you the director I you know are you Salam Bombay and she my mother said to somebody which then became the headline of the film festival she said I am the producer of the director <laughs> and you know a lot of people thought that was the headline <laughs> the next day the producer of the director of my mother in her beautiful sari <laughs> um, so a lot of people actually, oddly, Francis thought I, uh, the Salam Bombay was made by a man because mm. they had never seen anything quite like it. But they also thought, you know, it is pretty brutal. It's brutal and tender. It is that balance that is life and is the style of the film and it's the style of the, the children's lives. Um, but it was interesting to me that they thought a man would have made that only, you know, and then that was a big revelation that it was made by a woman, you know. Um, and uh, well, it was extraordinary because it began a spotlight on the film, as well as began a host of other pretty important prizes, I think 25 international awards that finally culminated in the Oscar nomination um, for India, which was the, only the second time ever in the history of this country uh, to have had that. It was Best Foreign Film nominated, um, uh, you know, and, and so on. So that, uh, all that was, you know, extraordinary. What happened to me was that I, I went on a nine month journey across the world, uh, you know, publicizing the film because the film was sold in every single country. And again, that was a first for an Indian yeah. film. And uh, but because the kids, we did not want, we only took the kids around for publicity in India, not abroad. Uh, because of that, uh, I had no actor or actress to go out and publicize the film. I had to do it. So that was an interesting eye opener and also very, uh, very exciting to go out to, you know, everywhere from Korea to Italy to, uh, you know, Sweden and anywhere. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, talk about the movies, but it was a nine month, you know, promotion, <laughs> which uh, was pretty uh, exciting, but exhausting. But throughout it, I was um, creating the Salam Balak Trust back at home and also avoiding repeating myself with the offers that came in of, you know, films that of every hue, you know, of every kids of every hue, you know, from South African to whatever, I would get a lot of some offers, you know, uh, but I didn't want to repeat myself. And that was the, the, that was the one thing I want to tell my audience is, you know, follow your instinct, you know, mm -hmm. don't become one of the pack just because, you know, um, I uh, stuck to my guns and uh, went to an idea uh, which became my second film, Mississippi Masala, mm -hmm. which was about the idea was about being brown between black and white, which was my experience as a young Indian student, you know, at college, um, how both communities were accessible to me and yet 
invisible lines were drawn uh, between us. And I wanted to explore that idea in some way, which then became Mississippi Masala a couple years later, which now it was re-released last week, right. April 15th, uh, and is in the theaters now, which makes me so delighted. Um, you know, one of the things you, you said about Salam Bombay is your own control as a director and sort of your own agency, um, which we notice glimpses of that through your work, subsequent works after Salam Bombay. Can you talk a little bit, um, some of your technical or artistic creative elements that sort of you still keep from Salam Bombay throughout all the other works, even up to now? You know, in retrospect, because it's been almost 35 years, in retrospect, I would say that one of the one of my habits or signature, as someone said, uh, is to cast people who embody the spirit of of whatever the story is, and to mix them up. You know, I always have right till the last thing I did. Um, you know, uh, this amalgamation of the first time actor who's never faced the screen, but for me really has the spirit. Again, it's back to the training of cinema verite, that, that truth is infinitely more powerful than fiction or, you know, and I want to always create that electricity of the unpredictable uh, in as documentary can do and as fiction often misses, you know. Um, and so that amalgamation of casting the non-actor or the first time actor with a legendary actor is something I've done uh, in almost every film, you know. Um, with Monsoon Wedding, it was Nasiruddin Shah, uh, the legendary actor as the father of the bride with uh, my own family sometimes as the family and different young actors, people I've met in the walking in the park, you know, literally I cast like that, you know, if, if I have to, um, because there's something not that just doesn't duplicate that. And I love the, I love the, um, I love the, uh, the sizzle that comes from putting a legendary actor who has a lot of tricks sometimes up their sleeve across from the non-actor, the first time actor, even Sarita Chowdhury, who was the first time actor in Mississippi Masala opposite of Denzel Washington. It's the same idea where one challenges the other in the most beautiful of way, ways to seek a, type of truth, you know. So in that sense, I would say that's one of my signatures. Yeah. And, and the other, there are several things, but for me, you know, the frame is sacred. The frame is sacred. You know, I, I came to filmmaking from a study of still photography. Uh, I understood how to, I was taught and I was kept understanding how to make a frame. So I have to enjoy the frame. It's not a question of just what I call join the dots filmmaking, you know, A plus B, you know, for me, that is so banal uh, that, you know, that you have to enjoy the frame and visual splendor is again, the most, uh, it's given to me in, in great gifts in my country, but also anywhere in the world, you know, and um, so how to do that and how to heighten the frame at all costs is, uh, is, is very important to me. And I would say, the use of music um, is, is uh, you know, something that um, I love to have the privilege of using and creating soundtracks often, often. My work is always or many times between worlds and the music, not just of, uh, you know, recorded music, but found music. Um, uh, um, you know, uh, the music of the street, the sound of the of the everyday, from birdsong to, um, to, you know, street vendors who use their voices. I love all that, you know. I love to use a mosaic of street sound uh, and make music of it. Um, and when I saw Salam Bombay after many, many years at a benefit when it was 20 years later at the British Film Institute, I think, I had to be woken up to the idea of silence because there was a lot of great, you know, it's not like you use music just to wallpaper the movie. I, I hate that way, you know, but how do you use music to, to 
propel the story or to deepen the story. Um, Satyajit Ray was a master of that. And he and his work really taught me how to inspired me about the use of music. But the use of music really is effective when, when juxtaposed with silence, you know, when it's not just constant bludgeoning of score telling you what to think, you know, but when there is a silence that, that, that then really makes the music or the sound sweeter, you know, that balance is critical to my work. Wow. Uh, thank you for those key words. I wrote down uh, visual splendor and mosaic of sounds. Wow. Uh -huh. um, I, you know, one of the things that I um, wanted to ask you is what's next for you? What's the, on the horizon that you can share with us? You know, uh, what's next is uh, unusual and I think exciting. Uh, it's national treasure. Uh, the, uh, there's a new television series uh, for Disney Plus that I did the pilot for, which comes out, I think, in August. Um, and this time, these are th these. It's written by the Wibblies, who wrote the original National Treasure movies um, with Nicolas Cage and so on. This time, it's with um, uh, Harvey Keitel and Catherine Zeta-Jones. But the protagonist of National Treasure is a 21-year-old Mexican girl, uh, undocumented, on DACA, uh, you know, a dreamer, and but she has this clue mind that, you know propels her to unlock clues that will then eventually yield, we hope, the national treasure. Um, and I've just finished that uh, in Baton Rouge. It's still being filmed, the other episodes, and that'll come out in August. Um, what I'm doing now is uh, a stage, a Broadway bound stage musical of Monsoon Wedding that I'm currently auditioning for and putting the team together. We are opening in November 22 at the World Cup in, in Qatar and then opening in London in uh, 23 uh, commercially. Uh, and then we'll hopefully come to America with it and New York and then India. Um, and also I'm making um, a very cool musical feature film with Pharrell Williams uh, doing music. Uh, again, it's a like a it's like a black brown wonderful affair. You know, it's it's in some ways I think of it as a wink to a sequel, not a sequel of Mississippi Masala, but it's it's the idea of uh, of of this interracial romance, but today, but it's a musical, and uh, and we are just completing the script and and hoping to go into production in a couple of months. Um, and lastly, I'm doing another very interesting series for Amazon um, called The Jungle Prince of Delhi, which is uh, based on a New York Times article by Ellen Barry, a true story that she unraveled about a, a, the, the, a woman who came into the New Delhi railway station in the 70s, lived there for 10 years with her hound dogs and her china and her servants and her two children and who in, proclaimed herself the last living descendant of the Mughal empire and wanted her property back. And how uh, this reporter sort of tracks down that story. She was eventually given a hunting lodge in the middle of Delhi by the Indian government to, to live in and eventually to die in. And, um, and Ellen sort of unravels this story. Was she true? Was she false? It's a real portrait of, of trauma and partition and displacement and what happens to the mind, you know. Um, so there's a lot on my plate uh, uh, one step at a time. <laughs> wow, that's very exciting. Thank you for sharing with us. Looking forward and, and congratulations on all the abundance that you're making happen. Um, at last question I wanted to ask was um, much of the focus during this time with our creative community is finding balance. In mm -hmm. your work, you've talked about rhythm and balance and finding that. Uh, we've often heard that you would start your production days with a yoga session. Mm, um, right. What can you share with this next generation of filmmakers, artists, and storytellers about finding their own rhythm and balance? Well, I think each one has to find their own way. Um, but what I have done, and it's really changed my life long time ago, um, is, is to study Iyengar yoga. BKS Iyengar is a great teacher and guru um, who, you know, who taught a form of classical 
aligning, you know, yoga, nothing fancy with, you know, hot yoga, this and sweat that and music, this, none of that. It's, it's, it's going to the classical yoga asanas, the poses, um, but it comes with rigorous teaching. And uh, it's sort of, I saw it, I don't meditate. I, it's, uh, practicing yoga is like a form of internal and physical meditation for me. And, uh, you know, uh, when I turned 40 when I was making Monsoon Wedding and I got tired of being absolutely wrecked after a film shoot, you know, the exhausted. And I decided to bring the yoga to the shoot. And that was the first time in Monsoon Wedding, I used to have a very senior Iyengar yoga instructor come with the, you know, to come to the set, to be part of our crew because our timings, our crews are all different, you know, with, with shooting. And then we would, uh, it was voluntary, but we would start with a one hour uh, every morning before call time. And it was, if you came, you came, if you didn't, there's no problem. But they, it sort of promoted a great stamina and an egolessness where the carpenter is next to the movie star is next to the director is next to you know all of us with our down dogs uh, but it it created a a, a muscular de-stressing i would say in any case it kept us going and it cultivated our, the stamina and the and the balance again that we needed that i certainly needed so then that became a tradition i don't have ask for any hollywood perks on my studio movies, I only ask for this, which is a senior Iyengar a yoga instructor has to be part of the crew. And so that's one thing. And um, in, for me, um, you know, my family is just vital. And I, I, you know, making films often, often involves sacrifice and leaving your children, leaving your family, you know, whatever. So I have to make the choices of the films I make very, very valuable to me. I mean, I don't just do anything. I'm ruthless about, you know, those choices, you know, is it worth it? So mostly I do my own work. I do my work, which doesn't let me go rather than be always on a job for hire. I, ra I hardly ever do that, you know. Um, and that helps me create a balance, you know, between family life and work life. And now my son is 30 years old. I don't have to, you know, worry about his schooling and all of that, you know, now we are off on our own, but um, it helped me a lot, you know, um, to embrace my family, my m mother and father-in-law and my, fa my mom would come with me as a caravan when Zoran, my son was young, when I would go through shoot, they would all come. And we would take a house and, you know, I, I would, you know, the kid was brought up amongst family and I had homemade food every night and it became, it, it became very uh, harmonious, you know, and that was why I never stopped working for a day, even as a young mother, you know, is my family gave me that support. And I think Asian Pacific, you know, audiences will understand that because we come from a culture of the extended family. I think it's one of the great deprivations of American life that, that you no longer live in three generations, like I have lived. And like, uh, thankfully, my son has lived. So that helped a lot. And then later in about, you know, in the, in, um, when I made Mississippi Masala, I uh, fell in love with my husband, Mahmoud, who's from Uganda, and we've lived in Uganda ever since. Uh, and that's where I started creating a garden. And I started becoming a, what I call a guerrilla planter. I plant trees anywhere, you know, and, and the, Living with nature uh, is just something that is, I think, my greatest teacher um, in, uh, in, in, in helping me understand the rhythm of life, you know, that things have their season, things decay is not, is, is natural, you know, is not something that you have to lament, you know, in fact, it teaches you what comes next, you know, as, as we know in the spring. And it seems simple, but when you live amongst it, when you, when you create uh, also nature. Uh, it's a very humbling uh, teacher. And uh, so these are the ways, but man, you know, uh, it's not always so calm and Zen. <laughs> it's <laughs> making films, I always say is a disease and either you're sick or you're not. And I am super sick. And, uh, uh, and but the, the other ways help the sickness in coming into being and in not, you know, exhausting us spiritually inside and outside. So that's how I do it, but everyone has to find their way. 
Uh, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for especially sharing the care and balance. And this is something that we see in the work that you make and create. Um, and thank you for, for, for all of that um, and having this wonderful, wonderful conversation with you. Thank you, Mary, for taking this time. Again, um, we'll be mailing this out to you, you. Um, you. Handmade Award, but thank you for the legacy that you continue to create and impact our communities. Uh, folks, if you're in Southern California, please come to the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival and check out some of our in-person screenings. Uh, for more information, uh, please visit festival.vcmedia.org. And thank you to all our VC supporters, sponsors, and VC family. We'll see you at the film festival. Once again, Mira Nair, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, really, Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival, because if we don't tell our own stories, no one else will. Thank you.